Good afternoon. I'm Gloria Nelson with Tug, and we're so glad to have you join us today for our Tug Connects 365 programming series. As you settle in and get ready for the start of today's webinar, let me give a brief introduction for Tug, the usergroup.org, for both our current members and for those of you who represent organizations that have not yet joined our online community of Infor distribution software users. Now we've all heard that phrase that knowledge is power. And I can say with confidence that after today's presentation, you'll be waking up tomorrow with a little more of both. Today is but one of our many in-depth sessions in our Tug Connects 365 series. Tug webinars, online forums, and member events facilitate the timely exchange of ideas and information to help you work smarter and with more confidence. Now that is a powerful combination. If you're currently a member, it pays to get even more involved. And if you're not, please visit our website to discover why 2300 heads are better than one to help you be the best at what you do. Before we get started, allow me to share some housekeeping information. Buckle up for about 35 minutes of content today. Drop your questions into the Q&A bubble on your toolbar. And also be aware that if you like it, it populates and bubbles up your question to the top in order of priority. And also feel free to open your chat window and talk with your peers. We'll be monitoring that as well for any kudos, compliments with regard to anybody that might be a current Unilog user as well as anything else that's pressing. And be aware also in that chat bubble that you can either just communicate with us as panelists or in that little blue window, drop down that arrow and communicate with everyone that's currently online as well. We monitor that. So we want you to be able to uh, really be engaged in the process. You also have control over your screen. If you go to the upper right hand corner of your screen, you'll have multiple options there in terms of how to optimize your viewing pleasure. Now, Unilog has also granted IP permissions with their webinar content. So feel free to grab screenshots as we move along through the links and also to copy any of the chat history as well. So without any further ado, it is now my pleasure to introduce Scott Freimeyer, Unilog Senior VP of Marketing. Scott, go ahead and take it away. All right, Gloria, thank you. Thank you and Gary and everybody at Tug. It's good to be with you guys today. I'm gonna to just switch over to my live screen here. You know, I, I think back to the, the last time I, I believe that I was in front of the Tug audience was at the, uh, the live in-person show back in March in Dallas. It was actually the last time I was on an airplane. Uh, so it's been a while, but, um, but we're all adjusting to this, uh, this new virtual environment and uh, happy to be having an audience with you today. So we're going to talk about how to improve your customer's experience on your e-commerce site today. And to start our conversation, I'd like to ask everybody, who is your competition online? So think about that just for a second. You don't have to chat it in, you don't have to type it in, but just, just think to yourself, who is your competition online? Now, I imagine a lot of you are probably thinking of maybe a, a local distributor or wholesaler in your market. Uh, you might also be thinking of somebody like Granger, uh, even Home Depot, especially after the, the acquisition or reacquisition of HD Supply, uh, MSC, Fastenal, you know the names, right? Amazon Business, certainly. Absolutely. Uh, these are all your competition. But that's not your only competition when it comes to setting a positive experience for your customers on your e-commerce site. This is your competition. Airbnb, Google, Netflix, Apple, Wayfair, uh, Uber. It could be any number of these tech companies that are out there. And you're saying, well, Scott, hold on. Wait a minute. Um, that, I, no, they, Netflix, don't they serve up streaming videos and movies? Uh, Airbnb, yeah, it's great if I want to make a vacation rental, but they're not selling or distributing abrasives or PPE or uh, pipe valve fittings. These, these aren't my competition. I'd argue that they are. If somebody goes, one of your customers who does purchasing on your e-commerce site, if they go to your, well, let's say they go to Wayfair on their lunch break and they're buying some furniture for their home. An hour later, they get back in their job and they're sitting down, they go to your website. Do you think they've forgotten what their digital experience was on Wayfair's website? I don't think so, right? That they've already set, the bar has been set by those companies as far as what a positive experience looks like what a really good website looks like. And it's entirely unfair, right? Because whether you're talking about uh, somebody who's a 10 million revenue company or 10 billion revenue company, 
uh, there's going to be vast differences there in their ability to compete online because of how deep their pockets are. So you're constantly being compared to people who uh, may outsize you significantly. But from a, an experience, a customer experience standpoint, that bar has been set by these companies. And, and your buyers, your customers do not forget those experiences when they go onto your site. So I want you to keep that in mind. We might have to kind of recalibrate our thinking a little bit about who our, our true competition is online when it comes to evaluating our customer's experience on our site. I'm going to talk about three areas of focus today on the call. Uh, the first is, I think you can put customer experience into three, three buckets. One, the general design, uh, site design and functionality of your site. And I'm not talking about, I don't want to talk about the design from an artistic uh, perspective because it's a, a little bit too um, subjective, I guess. Right. We all know there's sites out there that probably look like they were built in 1998 and they haven't been updated in a while. But but let's look at more of the, the navigation, the functionality of the sites. We'll get into that. We're going to talk about technical considerations when it comes to the speed of your site, the mobile experience. And then we're going to wrap up with product data and content and the role that that plays in providing a good, positive customer experience on your site. Now, as Gloria mentioned, uh, we encourage you guys on, on the Zoom meeting here to chat in any questions you have. You can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen in your interface there. If you have a question you'd like to share with uh, uh, Gloria and myself, she will help moderate those questions today. Or uh, as Gloria said, she encourages the chat. If you want to chat with other people on the call uh, or chat with us, you can use the chat window as well. All right, so let's get into general site design and functionality. I've put together just a very basic checklist here, some things you can go through. And this is what we're going to hit on, on uh, the first part of our call today. This is hardly an exhaustive list of things to look at when you're assessing your customer's experience on your site, but it's a starting point and hopefully gets you to think like your customers do when they're, when they're on your e-commerce site. So let's start, start with the site structure. All too often I see in our industry that a, a distributor's, wholesaler site, uh, manufacturer sometimes, the, the marketing site and the actual web store are two totally separate entities and never the two shall meet. It's as if there's, there's a separate sales and, and marketing are separate functions in the business. Um, I don't know if any of you fall into this bucket today, but it just as an example, and, and I've done my best list, and I'm going to show plenty of examples of, I think, what I think is a good po positive customer experience and maybe a not so good customer experience on different uh, B2B sites. I, I'm, I'm going to obscure as many of the logos as I can. I'm, I'm not trying to call anybody out. So um, that's why you'll see, um, hopefully I've caught it all and I'm not giving anybody away here because I'm not trying to pick on anybody. But here's a uh, distributor site. And when you come to their homepage, you'll notice that there is a, a link in the main navigation where that red arrow is pointing for shop online and another button in the bottom right for shop now. And when you click on that, you go to a login page that allows you to log into their web store where you can see their catalog. So what's so wrong with this? Uh, I would advocate that your marketing site and your commerce site, your shopping site need to be the same site. When you go to Amazon, you don't go to Amazon and get all their marketing information. Then when you want to buy something, you go to a different site, a subdomain or some other domain, right? It's all there. The navigation's consistent. Your ability to market to your customers is, is most likely going to happen as they're browsing your catalog. You don't want them to have to pop out of the store and go back to your site to see your marketing material or, or other messaging, right? Here's just another example. This is actually um, actually an electrical distributor, I believe. And again, I've obscured their, their logo here. But when you click on the shop button on their homepage, now it pops you into something that looks like this. OK, well, the navigation completely changed on me. From a customer experience standpoint, that's a bad thing. In fact, if I want to go back, in fact, I'll, I'll show you here. You can see on the main navigation, we had about products, resources, markets, locations, right? And if I wanted to see some of those resources that you have, because there may be some very good technical resources or training resources or videos that I want to watch. Once I get here, I can't see that unless I click this link to go back to, and then I, I grade out there the name of the, the company's homepage. That's a less than stellar customer experience right there. And this has implications beyond just the customer experience from an SEO perspective, search engine optimization. By hiding your catalog behind a login and having it on a separate domain, you are hurting your ability to market yourself to search engines and to other people who may be future customers. 
right? That search engines love that content, that product content. They want to see that. But by having a separate password protected site just for buying, you've actually hidden all that great content from those search engines. So I would strongly consider whether or not uh, you, you have a separate subdomain or domain for your e-commerce site. The marketing and sales function should be one and the same. That way you can merchandise, you can show related products, you can show promotions, you can talk about specials going on, uh, all using the same, the same site. Okay, let's move on. The site search experience. So most customers of yours and visitors, when they show up on your e-commerce site, are going to go right to the search field on your site. The vast majority of them will at some point. Usually it's right away uh, when they're looking for items. So a, a couple things to, to test on your site. First, do you have predictive type? So on this site, you can see I started to type in. This is actually a Unilog customer, our bill safety. And I've started to type in uh, rescue equipment. And as I type in rescue, it brings up, before I've even finished typing, some potential uh, pages I may want to visit, some, some prediction for what I'm typing. It even has an image ahead preview. So I can see some fall rescue equipment, fall protection equipment there, uh, other things that may fit my search term. And as I type more letters, these things will shift to try to get more accurate to what I may be looking for. All right, so you think about a positive customer site experience. This is one of those things that people have just become accustomed to, whether it's on, it probably started with Google, um, but you see on all sites now, predictive type, image ahead previews, right? Whether it's, or whether you're looking for categories, you're looking for brands, you're looking for items, the ability to see that as you're typing and then click on it quickly. Here's another thing. How, do your, how does your site handle misspellings? When somebody's searching for an item and they've misspelled it, does it return zero results or does it give them alternate suggestions? So on Distribution International site, again, another, uh, another Unilog customer, I came on this site searching for uh, foam glass insulation. And I've intentionally misspelled the word insulation. I typed, a, instead of an A, I typed an S there because it's close to it on the keyboard. And you can see in the search results, it did not return a zero result set for me. It actually understood that I was looking for insulation and it was probably an obvious mistype. So it went ahead and recommended what the correct spelling was, which you can see in italics there. Much better experience than something like this where I was on a, uh, an unnamed uh, distributor site and I searched for a ballast because I know they sell ballast. And I misspelled it with only one L and my search results were zero. Now I know they have it because I can see it in the left navigation there on the under the products navigation. But when I search this, it wasn't intelligent enough. The site wasn't intelligent enough to know that I probably just misspelled something that was very close to one of their keywords. So how well does your site handle misspellings? Let's talk about another thing that's very common nowadays for a positive customer experience, and that's synonyms. When people are searching your site, do you have synonyms set up? for certain keywords. Now I'm showing you this Google Trends screen to illustrate my point. In every industry that you guys serve, uh, there will be slang words, different industry jargon. Uh, somebody calls something this, somebody else calls it that, right? Somebody in this part of the country calls it X, somebody in that part of the country calls it Y. How well does your site capture those results? Now, it's kind of interesting when you look on Google Trends for search terms, you know, we've all done yard work, right? And maybe you have a weed whacker or a weed eater. Some people call it a string trimmer. Uh, this is interesting on Google Trends. If you go out here and look at and compare those three terms, weed whacker, weed eater, string trimmer, you find out that there's, there's very geographical, uh, geographic um, areas here that one term is more popular than the other. So I'm looking at the, the map of the United States there and anything in blue is the term weed whacker, which is what I call it. Well, it makes sense. I'm from Pennsylvania. <laughs> Pennsylvania seems to generally, most people in Pennsylvania call it weed whacker more so than weed eater or string trimmer. But hey, once you get into the, the rest of the country there and especially uh, you know the Midwest, the West, the South, it, weed eater seems to be the more common term that people refer to it as. So if um, I point this out to illustrate the point that if somebody's coming to your site and they search for a specific term, do you have all the industry jargon associated and synonyms associated with that term? For instance, um, in, the, in the electrical industry, you might distribute something that some people would call a thumper. 
Um, do you have that as one of your synonyms for a, uh, a wire fault tester, I think is what it is. Um, so there are, you know, you know your industries, right? You know what people call, maybe a contractor calls something a certain term, right? Do you have all your synonyms set up on your site so you can capture those searches and make sure you're directing people to the terms that they're looking for? That's a good customer experience. Okay, what else can we talk about on our checklist? Taxonomy. Taxonomy, what are we talking about? Taxonomy, how you classify and group things on your site. Okay, so I'm here on Quality Mills Supply Site. This is an industrial distributor. And on the left hand side there, you'll see the shop by category and all the different categories of products. This is how, they, how they've organized or put into a taxonomy their catalog. So then if I clicked on electrical, I'd see electrical tools, I'd see industrial control, I'd see wiring devices, wiring connectors, and so on. My taxonomy is how I've grouped like items. Now, on your site, how well structured and organized is your taxonomy? Because I think what happens very often is we pull information out of our ERP, whether you're on SXE or FAX or A+, whatever Infor solution you're running, you pull that information out. And the way you've classified and grouped items in your catalog, in your ERP, may be a little bit different than how somebody who's coming to visit your site would logically think about how I'm going to drill down into those categories and find what I need. So take a look at your site and, and assess how, how good is my taxonomy, my organization from my buyer's perspective? Does it make sense? It's both equal parts art and science. And there are things related to taxonomy with your attributes and such for your items that, um, that can cause some wonky things to happen on your site. Again, another site I've obscured the logo. This is a, um, a hose distributor and I'm drilling down into some marine exhaust hoses here. And on the left-hand side in the red box, I can see, hey, this is great. Okay, I can filter these products by their attributes. Well, the attribute is called size one. I don't know what size one is. But anyway, uh, I can see, I can, I can filter by things that are four inch, six inch. Oh wait, then it goes to 14 64ths then 28 64ths. But then further down, it goes to 0.88 inch, one inch, 1.13 inch. Well, this is all out of order, right? From, from a, a buyer's perspective, a visitor of your site, as they're hitting this, they're looking at this and say, wait, how do I find what I need here? Everything is not in its proper size order. In fact, on the same site, if I scroll down a little bit further, and there's a lot of different sizes on here. Well, part of the reason is because sometimes they list the sizes in 3.5 inches and sometimes three and a half inches. It's the same thing, right? But they haven't paid close attention to some of the specs and the attributes uh, in the, of the items in their taxonomy and, and they haven't normalized that. So that's creating a negative customer experience. When, or most likely they'll just miss. They'll say, okay, three, 3.5 inches, there's two items there. I didn't even see the other two items that were in the three and a half inch category. All right, let's talk about something called product groupings. Think about when you search a site and I went out to a, an industrial supplier here and I was searching for some flocked latex gloves. Well, I searched a site and it gave me 23 results. And as I went through these results, almost every one of them was the exact same glove. The only difference here being that basically the glove size, right? So 23 different results, and you could probably consolidate this. I think there were maybe three different gloves in these results. So you could probably consolidate that, this down to three results and present a much more manageable list of results for your customers to browse. Here's a site that does it right. This is Mallory Safety, a Unilog customer. Searching for um, sort of gloves on this page, I can see when I'm looking for electrical gloves, it brings up, here's the Novax gloves, but there are six choices I can look at. And it consolidates those into a product family or product grouping. So rather than having six more options, and then below that, there are six options of the other glove, and below that, the six, seven, eight options of the other glove, right? That just creates a really cumbersome, uh, overpopulated, screen of results to look through. If I'm going for a good customer experience on your site, do you group like items, whether it's a glove or it could be a hex nut, right? You know, a hex nut might have different sizes or different platings. Um, you could have gloves, you could have a, a hot water heater uh, that has you know, different capacities, but it's essentially the same item. 
right? Are all those ex displayed in one grouping where then when you click in, then you see, okay, and here's how many I need to order of which size. It's a much better customer experience. By the way, I give Mallory some extra credit. They have their Prop 65 warnings on here. That's good to see. Always good if you're selling into California residents or California businesses. All right, let's talk about past purchase lists. Here's another thing on our checklist. How easily can your buyers and customers access lists of items that they've purchased previously or items they may want to purchase? Now, I didn't put any screen captures together for this. I would have had to go in and log in as, as some actual customers to get good screenshots. But let's just talk through this real quick. Um, you know, I have, uh, there's, there's one customer of ours, uh, Gary Pacific, I think it was, who on their site, when they first launched their site, they had, a link in the navigation that said my Geary favorites. And if even if you had never shopped on the site before, all you had done was offline purchases, you know, over the phone or through your inside sales rep, you could come out there on the site, click my Geary favorites, and it would show you everything you've purchased from them in the past. Made it really easy to start using the site because they had their previous purchase history there. Let's face it, a good bulk of, of your purchases on your, on your site or for, with your business are going to be repeat orders. So let's, let's put it into three buckets here, right? Do you have lists that your customers can build, either lists of, of items that they've purchased before that you build for them based off of their purchase history? Are there lists that they can build on their own, like a saved favorites list or multiple, sa multiple saved lists that they can access by user? Or lists that your sales reps can put together of, of specifically curated items for that customer or that specific user? Okay, so how easily can your customers access products by looking at lists of, again, things that they've purchased, things that they want to purchase or have interest in, and things that your sales reps want them to see? All that lends to a really good customer experience. Let's move on to the next item, alerts. The most popular one, the abandoned cart alert. Uh, there's still a lot of customers who, who aren't taking advantage of this out there. A lot of distributors who don't take advantage of this. But if somebody's purchasing on your site, they built a cart, and then for whatever reason, they abandoned it, right? Maybe they had some questions about the pricing. Maybe they weren't sure if it's the item that they wanted. Maybe they just got busy and forgot. Uh, do they get within 24 hours a reminder that says, oh, you guys, uh, you, you had a, a cart out there. You were this close to going over the finish line. Uh, perhaps you'd, you'd, like to, um, you'd like to go ahead with a purchase. Or if you have any questions or need help, or need help with this order, here's who to contact so we can take care of this. So let's work on getting those conversions happening on the site. Let's work on converting those carts into purchases. And something like this is just a really friendly reminder for a customer that they actually had a cart out there that they just might've forgotten about. Okay, another one, quick order pad, something I'm sure many of you are familiar with. A lot of your purchasers are buying bulk items, uh, many items that they've, again, repeat items they've purchased in the past. They may have a spreadsheet of items that they need to purchase from you and they don't wanna to have to browse your site, they just wanna go in and put in the keyword or put in the, um, the item number, the quantity and click go and have it all added to the cart and, and check out. But uh, even though this, is, um, this has been around, quick order pads have been around for a while and many people are, are familiar with them, uh, there's still some out there that really don't work too well when you get into it. So this is, this is what I mean by customer experience. Just because it says you have a quick order pad on your site does not mean it's good experience. I was on a site just the other day where somebody had a quick order pad and I decided to test it out and it worked fine for the items that they had in stock. Uh, but if I mistyped a number, an item number or something wasn't out of stock, then things got wonky, right? So I actually intentionally mistyped an item or put an item, a manufacturer part number that this distributor did not carry. And when it returned the results, it said some of these items couldn't be found. There were errors with this to figure out what they were download this Excel spreadsheet and open it up and it will show you the error codes. <laughs> I was like, really? I have to download an Excel spreadsheet to find out what you couldn't add to the cart? Um, so again, this is all things that if you go through and you walk through your site in the boots of your customer and in their shoes and, and you, you go through a day in the life, you will find things I'm, I'm pretty sure that you think could be a better experience for them. And then finally, in this section uh, of design and functionality, when it comes to the functional capabilities of your site, BOPIS or buy online, pick up and store. Now I know that's a retail term, uh, but you know, often in our industry, they call it curbside or dockside pickup. But can your customers opt to 
to you know purchase and pick up from different locations, branch locations. If you have a front counter, uh, maybe you have a warehouse and you want to do dockside pickup outside. Can they go on your website and, and then pick up? So this is Granger's site. They obviously support picking up from many of their locations and you can see um, you know, availability and pickup times uh, when things will be ready. So if you have a contractor who needs to come in in the morning and they just you know, want to be in and out, they don't want to sit there at the front counter waiting in line. They just want to get in and out, pick up their stuff and go. Um, obviously with the pandemic, curbside pickup has become incredibly popular right now. Uh, when you think of Home Depot and Lowe's, the majority of their e-commerce business is pickup and store. Uh, so, uh, of course, again, just because you have the option to curb, do curbside pickup doesn't, <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good positive customer experience. Okay, I think about just last week, actually, just this past weekend, I went to Home Depot site to buy some Christmas lights for outside my yard. Uh, if you ever were to drive by my house this time of year, it looks very similar to the uh, Clark Griswold National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation Home. I mean, I, I have lights everywhere. So I had to buy like 10 more strands of lights to, to complete the project. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to try to use their curbside pickup. I'm going to be in a little bit of a rush when I'm out. I don't want to go into the store and mess around. So I went ahead, put the order online, did curbside pickup, and I said it'll probably be ready in less than two hours, and I'll get a text alert. Okay. Well, almost four and a half hours went by before I finally got that text alert that said, oh, we're finally ready. Four and a half hours. So I pulled up to the curbside pickup spot in the parking lot. It was a little after six o'clock. And I opened my app and I go to click on, I'm here, bring out my order. And it says, oh, sorry, by the way, curbside pickup's not available after 6 p.m. You have to come into the store. <laughs> So here I was, I went through the whole curbside pickup experience, the customer experience, right? One thing, you have the functionality on your site, but is the experience a good one? I had to wait two and a half hours longer than my expectation just for them to tell me the items had been picked and then come down to the store and find out I couldn't even do curbside. I had to walk inside. So um, look at it from every angle, right? Not just the capabilities of your site, but how does it work in to your processes? I've talked to uh, customers of ours and distributors who when they do curbside pickup, you know, and, and buy online pickup in store, they want to have things ready. There's one that wants to have it ready and available in under 10 minutes for any order placed online that's in stock, which is really aggressive, I think. Um, but it's a great goal. So they've totally re-engineered the processes to make sure that if somebody goes online, says, I want to pick up in your store in 10 minutes, it's picked and ready for them to pick up. Okay, so again, that's a, a brief checklist of some items here on design and functionality. We're going to get into a couple of other things. I do want to ask a quick poll question. By the way, again, this is not an exhaustive list. I could easily double or triple this list, uh, but it's about thinking like your customers think. So quick poll, Gloria, if we could bring up this poll question, uh, based on what you've seen so far, are there things that you can improve on your own site? So just give me a quick yes or no here. Based on what you've seen so far in this presentation, are there things that you could go back and look at your own site and you think could be available for improvement? Now, the answers are number one, yes, there's opportunity for improvement, or number two, no, our site is perfect so far. <laughs> hey, uh, some of you are, are killing it out there. Maybe, maybe you, uh, you have covered all these bases. So, all right, what do you think, Gloria? Do we have some result sets? All right, <laughs> that's good. Um, Everybody so far, 100% of you said, yes, there's opportunity for improvement. And that's what I would expect, okay? So let's move on. I wanna talk about, and we're gonna go through this a little quick, technical considerations, um, because they do impact your, your experience, your customer's experience on your site. And there's both the mobile experience and the speed of your site are kind of the two biggest one under the technical considerations. So for mobile, how well does your site render on a mobile device? Well, there's a very simple test you can do. If you're not sure, obviously you can pick up your phone and look, uh, but you can go to Google's mobile friendly test. It's here's the URL and I assume these slides will be available to you afterwards. So, uh, but if you just Google, Google mobile friendly test, uh, you'll get a web page. And when you put in your URL, um, it will tell you this page is mobile friendly or this page is not mobile friendly. And it'll give you a preview of, of what this site looks like to Google on a mobile device. Okay. I would hope that most people pass this test by now, right? Um, I, I think most sites are, this is not the mobile app, this is just a mobile responsive website, which is incredibly important for your customer experience. However, just because you pass this test does not mean 
that you actually have a mobile responsive site that's easy to use and provides a good customer experience. As an example, I'm going back to another one of these uh, sites here that I saw from a hose distributor. When you mouse over their main navigation, go to fittings and valves, this is the sub menu that pops up on there. This is on their website. It's the most massive sub menu I think I've ever seen on a website before. Well, how does this render on a mobile device? There's no way you can fit all those categories on the screen. And you would think that you could just scroll down through the categories, but actually when I went on this site, I, there was no way for me to scroll down. So most of the categories on their site, I was not even, even able to access on a mobile device unless I could see it on a full desktop view because the menu was so massive. So again, just because it seems like a good experience doesn't make, mean it is. Uh, Turtle and Hughes, another Unilog customer does something very simple. On their website, at the top, they have their phone number. If you'd like to call them, place an order. But the phone number is clickable. It's not just hard-coded text, it's actually a clickable link. So when you go to their, if you're looking at Turtle and Hughes's website on a mobile device, and you, you always see the phone number at the top, you just touch the phone number and it dials the number for you. You don't have to rekey it, copy and paste or anything like that minor thing, but it makes such a huge improvement in the customer experience when they're on your site. All right, the other checklist of technical considerations is speed. How long does it take to load pages and content on your site? There's a couple speed tests that you can do. Uh, one is Google PageSpeed Insights. The other is Pingdom, which is a uh, SolarWinds technology, Pingdom, that you can use. And I'm going to go to Pingdom site here. So I did a, a, a Pingdom test where you just put, pop, pop in your URL to the field here. Uh, again, I've hid the, this customer, or not, not a customer of Unilogs, I've hid this distributor's uh, logo, so you don't know who their site is. But uh, this did not get a very good grade. They got a D, a 70 performance grade. Um, the load time was 3.83 seconds, according to Pingdom. Uh, and they'll give you some recommendations of things you can do uh, to, to make improvements to the site. Google uh, does the same thing on their PageSpeed Insights. They're, they're very technical in some of the recommendations. Now, I'd caution that some of these speed tests can be misleading and can take you down a rabbit hole of, of making a lot of really highly technical tweaks to your site. So what I'd recommend is if your site ever looks like this, which is this site I just pulled up today, uh, one of an uh, industrial distributor site, when I searched on an item, I got this for about five, six, seven seconds. It was just like this flashing, rotating, loading thing. And then said, your request is currently being processed. Please stand by. Every time I accessed a page of the site and searched on a product, I got this. If your site does that, there's obviously a problem. Okay. So go through your site and maybe time how long it takes to check out on your site. Uh, Glory, could you pop up another poll question here. I'm curious, have you guys ever timed how long it takes to check out on your site? Have you gone through as a customer and maybe it's just with your phone and a, and a you know, stopwatch. Have you ever timed, yes or no, how long it takes to check out on your site? Because sometimes you can have, Ida, uh, you can have checkout processes that are a little bit cumbersome. Um, you know, this also comes into play when you think about registering as a customer on your site. So we had a customer it was a, jan a janitorial sanitary supply distributor, uh, actually an Infor customer. Um, Hill, I can say the name, I think Hill and Marks. And um, they recently redesigned their site and they timed before and after how long it took to go through the process of registering as a new user or to check out an item. And what they found was there was a lot of fields that they were requesting that they simply did not really need at that moment. So they took them out and they're convinced that that's gonna help with their conversion rates. So what are the uh, what are the results look like here? Is anybody actually timed? So about half and half, forty seven percent to fifty three percent. Okay, good. Um, I'm glad to see that that some of you, a number of you, have time. That's that's a good sign. Um, just again, it's all about looking at your site from your customer's experience, from their eyes. Okay, final section, and we'll wrap things up. Product data and content. The third part of creating a really positive customer experience. So this is a Unilog customer, Quality Mill Supply. I'm searching for something as simple as a heavy duty screw anchor. And I've come to this item detail page. 
Um, obviously, I can see the, the name of the item. I can see all the, the part numbers, the quality mills part number, the manufacturer part number, UPC, but call out a few things. Look, multiple product images, a nice robust description, all the specifications as far as the drill size and the material and the length, all the features, guides and manuals, even video links for this item. This is something as simple as a heavy duty screw anchor and look how robust and rich that content is. This creates a really positive customer experience on your e-commerce channel. Okay, and Quality Mill, the business impact is quite evident. I, I, they've seen, uh, I think 20X increase or so, or to, more than 20X increase in site visitation uh, once they launched their site with Unilog and, and populated the new product content that they have. It really made a huge difference in how people use their site. Listen, uh, oh, here's another one. Um, the ability to add a part number. Here's a great customer experience item for you. So on Quality Mill site, say I in my business have my own part number for this part. I can add it to your site, the distributor site, and save it under my log. You know, so it's saved associated with my login. So when I come to your site in the future and search for my part number, that item comes up that I'm looking for. So I don't have to remember what your part number is. Right, great customer experience thing. Listen, if you go through your site and your product detail pages look something like this, no images, no descriptions, no specs, no attributes, no product content, you know, no model numbers, very, very basic information with not a lot, a lot of description, uh, there's room for improvement. And here's a tool I'm gonna give you, and this was something that I'm sharing courtesy of Bob Lewis, who's the founder of Impacts. Um, they are a, uh, an e-commerce, service provider that uh, we've partnered with at Unilog and done many projects with. And um, I'm using this with uh, Bob's blessing because he was really the one that came up with this and I wanna give him credit, but I think it's a fantastic tool for how to assess the quality of the content on your site and, and, and prescriptive measures you can take to improve. So if you were to measure every item detail page of your site, every product page on your site by the number of hits it gets and the conversion rate, the number of conversions. Uh, so conversions means somebody actually put that item into a cart and then hopefully purchased it. And you can track that with Google Analytics, right? Uh, or, or maybe the analytics in your actual analytics platform for your e-commerce platform. You can basically drop your, your content into four different quadrants. There's, and what we're all shooting for is the high number of hits, high number of conversions, product detail pages, right? That's the top right. That's what we want to get to. In the lower left, we have the yeah low hits, low conversions. In other words, I can't find it and I don't need it. Uh, but the ones I really want to focus on are the top left where somebody found it, but they can't confirm what it is. And then the bottom right, they, they want it, but they can't find it. So let's start with the top left. Found it, can't confirm. What do I do in that case? Well, if I found it, but I can't confirm, maybe it's because I'm not sure if that's the item I wanted. I might need to see more images. You might need to improve the descriptions on that page or provide more specs and attributes, maybe adding product reviews or Q&A capability on that page. So you can have questions and answers addressed about that product, things that will help give people confidence that that is the item they need to buy. Obviously displaying pricing and availability as well. But then you get down to the bottom right, which is um, I do want it. You gave me plenty of information about it, but I can't find it on your site. Well, Maybe we need to go back and set up synonyms for those slang terms that we talked about or adding different search keywords to the page. Maybe we need to uh, test our search configuration on the site to make sure that the results, when we type certain search phrases, the right results and the right products are coming up. Or we create search-driven promotions. So when people search on a certain term, we bring the products that we think are going to be most relevant to them. Uh, we can promote those items to the top. Maybe it's something with PPE right now, right? Um, there's certain, you know, somebody searches on COVID, you want certain PPE items to come to the top. But there, there are some, you know, prescriptive things you can address for each quadrant there. And then if you, if you do have things in the found it, bought it, the, the Nirvana state, right, then you want to create additional product associations, you know, people who bought this also bought that, um, so that you can continue adding to that order and increase your AOV. All right, so that's a helpful tool, I think. Uh, let's wrap this up by just saying five things that you can do right now. I, I promise, Glory, I try to get this done in 35 minutes. I think I'm pretty close. <laughs> so um, five things you can do now. One, 
how do you assess your customer's experience? Well, start by talking to them, survey them about their experience on your site. Ask them if you haven't already. What are things we do well? What are things we could improve? I would go ahead and evaluate the capabilities of your site according to some of the checklists that we put in this presentation today. Uh, all of you said, 100% of you said there are things that you can improve in, in that checklist. So pick out what a, a few of those items are and go tackle those now. Uh, for those that you haven't yet timed the process of checking out or registering on your site, let's do that, right? Let's figure out how long does it really take? Let's assess the, the experience from a customer's perspective and, and, and appreciate their time and try to make it as flu or as a, expeditious as possible. Assess the product detail pages according to the hits and conversion rate. So that chart, that quadrant that we just showed you. Being able to look at how, how easy your content is to find and how well it converts. And then finally, suggesting forcing your employees to use the site to make purchases for a week. Maybe it's your, your inside sales team, for your people at the front counter. Um, make them use the site. Now, don't, don't get out of the ERP for a second. Go through the site if you haven't already do, done this. And, and we've had customers, this is how they train their, their employees on their site, on their new site. They actually make them order. So if somebody comes to their front counter, they actually have to place the orders via the site because not only do the, they learn how to communicate the value of the site, but then they can give you feedback on things that you can improve. Listen, your employees have a great frame of reference. They know all those sites that we talked about at the beginning, Airbnb and Uber and Google and Apple and Wayfair and Netflix. So they already know what a really good digital experience looks like. Get them to help show you and make recommendations on, on things that you could be doing better on your site. All right, uh, I know we're gonna go to q and I'm sure we have a couple questions here. Um, Gloria, I, if I could real quick, just for people who, tell you what, what, what yeah, let me, let me just hit this real quick if I could. Um, if, for those of you who aren't familiar with Unilog, we are the provider of powerful, affordable B2B e-commerce solutions for mid-market B2B companies, very much like yourself. Um, that means that we can build the e-commerce site for you and then give you the platform to manage that on an ongoing basis, the CMS, the PIM, everything you need to manage your digital channel. I use those terms intentionally, powerful and affordable, because I think some people think because they um, if you were to have a powerful e-commerce platform, it's going to cost an arm and a leg. Or if you have an affordable platform, it doesn't have the leading progressive B2B capabilities that you require and your customers require for a really good site experience. I'm here to tell you that's that's those terms are not mutually exclusive. You can have both. And that's been our goal from day one. Uh, just to validate this, there's a report that I would um, I'd be happy to share with you. Actually, you can access it on our website. I'll show you where in just a second. But uh, Andy Hoare, former Forrester analyst, uh, has a report that uh, is out with his new company now, Paradigm B2B, called their Combine. And for 2020, he evaluated 16 different mid-market e-commerce vendors in the space. And I'm happy to say that Unilog uh, came home with the most gold medals across all the 10 categories that he evaluated the vendors against uh, and, and actually had the most overall medal points. So we're pretty proud of that. And if you'd like to look at the evaluation of those platforms, just go to our site. It's at unilogcorp.com, unilogcorp.com. And you can see right there at the bottom, uh, just below the main kind of uh, header image there, you can see the Paradigm B2B Combine report and you can download it for free on our site. So I'd invite you to do that. Uh, and then finally, we don't just uh, help you with the e-commerce site and give you the platform, but we can also help with your product content. We talked about how critical that is to your experience, your customer's experience. Uh, we can actually help go through your catalog and enrich, whether you have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of items. Uh, we can take product detail pages that look like what you see on the left side of your screen there and make them much more robust. So they look at what you see on the right side of the screen, with multiple product images, specs, attributes, descriptions, and so forth. Okay. All right, Gloria, I've been talking for a while. I'm sorry. I should have paused a little and given you a chance to, I'm sure there's some questions that came through, but I think you're muted. Thank you. We do have some questions. Um, first one is, how tightly is a platform integrated to SX Web UI to use a customer specific UM and pricing? Yeah, so we've done, uh, yeah, Unilog, we've done integrations with, um, I think it's more than three dozen SXE customers to this point. Uh, so we have a very good handle on that integration and what it takes to pull over customer specific pricing, availability, um, you know, having, having catalogs specific to customers and such. So uh, very tightly integrated, yes. 
Okay. And the next question is for our site search syn synonyms, do we put those synonyms in the product description or somewhere else? Good question. I should have clarified. Yes. Yeah, so um, with, with, if you have synonyms in the Unilog e-commerce platform, there's actually a page to establish what you want your synonyms to be. It's not something you put on the, in the description or the keywords field in the, in the, um, on the product detail. It's actually a, um, a synonyms field where you can create um, even synonyms for things like foot, feet, FT period, right? Um, it's it kind of a, a separate page. Uh, if, if you don't have that capability, I, you might be able to leverage in another platform, you might be able to leverage a keywords field for your synonyms or put it into the description somewhere at the bottom. Uh, but I know in Unilog, we actually have a synonyms uh, database basically. Wonderful. Um, also, another great question that was posed is what typically slows down your page load the most? All right. So we're talking about page load speed times. Yeah. And you know what? I, I think what I've seen is it's the calls back to the ERP. And if that to the, to the point about the integration, the question about the integration before, if you don't have a good handle on that integration, um, those ERP calls for pricing availability for some e-commerce platforms takes a long time. And that's why you get those please hold, wait, holding, spinning error messages, not error messages, but just, you know, progress messages. Um, I, yeah, that with some vendors, I've was it some e-commerce vendors, I've seen that take quite a long time and have a, a big hindrance on, on page load times. And uh, the final question that I have is, do we have to be on Unilog e-commerce platform in order for Unilog to help us with our product content? No, thanks for asking. Not at all. Um, if you do, I mentioned we do product content services. Uh, you do not have to be running our e-commerce platform. We can, um, we can certainly uh, provide, you, know, you would export your catalog. We would go ahead, enrich it, give it back to you. You don't have to be on our platform. You can pop it into whatever, uh, you know, put it back into your ERP, or if you have a PIM, which is kind of what we recommend as the preferred way to go to have a product information management module where you can put all, house all that content, because there is an awful lot of, of really rich product content that we can provide, um, but you need all the kind of uh, the fields to hold that much content. That's wonderful. Scott, that takes care of all of our questions. I want to thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge with everyone that's joined us today. And as with most of our webinars, this presentation will be available on our TUG website for future reference and, um, and accessibility along with review the following business day. And also we encourage you to avail the forum boards to further your discussion on this great product. And also make sure that you keep an eye on your inbox because we do have a webinar coming up next Friday and we'd love to have you for those that would apply to their day-to-day -day business, join us. And for those of you who are not yet members of TUG, please visit the usergroup.org and join us today. Scott, again, thank you. And as they say in Hollywood folks, that's a wrap. <laughs>